Hebrews chapter number 11. I'm going to begin reading verse number 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made up of things which do appear. Now, best definition you're ever going to get of faith is in verse number 1, because that's how God defines faith. Verse number 1 gives you the truly heavenly definition of the word faith. Okay, it is the substance of things hoped for. Now, where man gets a little confused on that is man starts trying to define the words in the verse to make it mean what they want it to believe. Okay, they want to define faith the way that they see fit, so they start changing the words of substance, evidence, right, hope. Well, some of them yahoos, okay, they change that word substance. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. They change that to the assurance of things hoped for. Well, if faith was assurance, right? That doesn't make sense. You're believing because you've received part of something that you've already hoped for. Like a down payment. Right? Now, we do know that the Holy Ghost was the earnest of our salvation, but it doesn't say anything about the earnest of our faith. Oh, no. God says that our faith can be complete. Right? Look at verse number 2. For by the elders obtained a good report. Right? Our faith isn't contingent upon what we receive. Our faith is contingent upon in whom we have believed. So faith is not the assurance of things hoped for. Right? I did not receive my faith as you know a bit of assurance that God can do what he said he could do. No, God can do what he says he's going to do whether I believe it or not. That my faith is not contingent upon me receiving things. Right? But then, it goes on to say, the evidence of things I see. Now, a lot of people, well, what does evidence mean? Okay? Or they'll change that to the proving or the proof of things not seen. Well, evidence and proof are two different things. Evidence means without a doubt it's been proven to be true. You use proof to make evidence. Okay, I can prove that I was at a certain place at a certain time, but that doesn't mean that it has been shown into evidence that I didn't do something that I was accused. I can be over here, but still make a phone call. I can be over here and still know about what's going on over there, but I'm over here so that I have an alibi. Okay, I can be at the right place in the right church service I can have proof that I was sitting in the pew, but there may not be any evidence that what was preached changed what was in my heart. I was there, but there's no evidence that it had an impact on me. Right? I'm not looking for proof. The world likes to say, well, there's proof that COVID you know, killed all these people last year. Yeah, but cancer didn't. And then the flu didn't. And nobody died of heart attacks. And everybody that had a stroke also had COVID. Right? That's proof. The evidence suggests is a point in the man wants to die. The evidence is that there's a day that God gave all of us, whether we're ready for it or not. The evidence is, is that if God says it's not my time, no man can change that. The evidence is if God says it ends with my time, Man can't change it. Man's days are few and full of trouble. Take no thought of tomorrow. Today's the day that the Lord has made. I may not have tomorrow. A whole lot of struggle. The evidence is that God's right. The evidence is that this sin, cursed flesh, is going back to the ground. The proof of why that happens is irrelevant. I believe that God said there's a day I was going to die. It's going to happen. may not be today. may not be tomorrow, but it's going to happen. I'm really hoping, Brother Brian, I don't have to go through that. You know, I'd be in part of that group where first them that are in the ground, they get caught up first, and then we get caught up to meet them a little bit later. But either way, we're going one way or the other. 
That's evidence. Okay. Some people like to use proof. Proof is used to prove what is evidence. I can say it's true. That doesn't mean it's proof. There's a lot of people that say, well, because I believe this, things are going to happen. Where's the evidence? I don't want to... Joel Osteen, look at me. Yeah, well, you're conning people out of money. Of course, you've got good things happening to you. You're robbing people. Right? Or so many of them, Peter Popoff and all them other wackos throughout the years, right? What is that? Ken Copeland? I know one of them out in Texas or something. Right? Claims he had to have a private airplane to go and minister to people because there's a whole lot of demons that fly on, you know, public airways. That was his reasoning. Uh, yeah, people make me angry on public airways too, but I've never been grieved in the spirit hopping on a Delta flight. What do you say? There's a lot of proof out there. But see, God shows what evidence, those are the things that have been tested out true. That's evidence. I can offer you proof, but whether or not it's taken as evidence is two different things. Okay, so when we get down to what faith really is, how does God define faith? Well, it's the substance of things hoped for. Okay, the substance of something is if you were to break it down into its smallest pieces, that's what makes up most of it. Okay, a lot of us don't like to admit it. But yes, chocolate, the substance of chocolate is sugar. Yeah. You can call it dark chocolate or you can call it whatever, you, it's sugar. I don't care. Well, a little bit's healthy for you. Well, I, I, I don't have that thing in my head that says, this is enough of it. I just sit down there and I'll eat dark chocolate all day long. Especially because nobody else in the family likes dark chocolate. So I end up getting all of it. Yeah. But if we were to break it down, what's the substance? It's sugar. What's the substance of Diet Mountain Dew? Caffeine. That's why I drink it. Okay, the substance of something is the biggest part. You can add things to it, but really when you boil it down, when you really look at what it is, what is it? The substance is what makes it up. It's the greatest part of it. So faith is the substance of things hoped for. Those things which you set your sight on, those hopes and those desires, you know what causes those things to take root in your heart? Faith. Faith is the largest part of whatever it is that you desire in life. It doesn't say that faith is the substance of heavenly things. So, no, you're using faith to develop your hopes and your dreams. It's the substance of what drives your ambitions. Because if you didn't think you could achieve it, why would you waste time doing it? Those things which you hope for, that you would like to see happen, Right? Those things that you want to happen so badly, that you hope for them so much, you change your life to live it in a way that it's more likely that you'll receive those things that you hope for. If somebody's willing to change how they live their life in order to make sure they have a better chance of receiving something, that shows that they really have faith in that hope, in that dream. You don't hope for something, truly, you don't believe in it. You don't want it to happen if you're not willing to change something to make sure that it's more likely that you have that thing that you desire happen in your life. Good, bad, pretty ugly. Doesn't matter what you want to hope for. Faith is that you've changed. You've reorganized things. You've recategorized things to make sure that the thing that you want to happen is most likely to happen. Okay, well, faith is the substance of things. So the evidence of things not seen. Well, the proof or the evidence, so to speak, that you really do believe something is that you're willing to change your life. But see, faith is the evidence of things not seen. Okay, this one, I'm going to try my best to explain this the way that God explained this to me. And if I confuse you, I'm sorry. Okay, evidence of things not seen. I can tell you that 
Let's see. Let's get a good one. It's really hard to appreciate Brother Bob's attempt every week to park into the back of the parking lot. Okay? If you ask him, he says he parks in the back of the parking lot because he never wants to be the reason that a visitor, first time visitor, that a, a preacher, an evangelist, somebody just stopping by because they had down at the Creation Museum and they were looking for a church to attend today. He never wants to be the reason that somebody can't find a parking spot close to the front door. He thinks that, I've had this conversation with him many times, that he doesn't want to be the reason that somebody says, well, they weren't friendly, they weren't, he doesn't want to be the reason that it didn't appear that our church was receptive to visitors. He just wants to be good to other people. Now see, if we were to say, well, Brother Bob parks in the back of the parking lot, that doesn't have anything, right? It's just he parks in the back of the parking lot. But see, if we were to say that Brother Bob see, cares about visitors, whether they're lost folk, whether they're saved folk, people that are just stopping by, that he wants to give such a good impression of the Emmanuel Baptist Church that he's willing to park the faith is him parking in the back of the parking lot. Well, what's he hoping for? The evidence of things I say. But Bob believes that there's going to be visitors at every church service. If he didn't, why would he park in the back of the parking lot? But Bob believes that there's somebody that needs a better parking spot than him that he wants to be good to. If you didn't believe, right, that you were going to get paid on Friday, you wouldn't go to work. What's the point in going? If you don't get paid. Right? Your faith, talking more than just what you believe, but again, how you live, your faith is evidence of the fact that you believe that it's really going to happen. Substance of things hoped for is, is I'm going to do my best to remove anything out of my life that would prevent it from happening. Evidence of things not seen is, I'm going to live like it's actually going to happen because I believe that it's going to happen. If you believe that something will happen, right, you're just going to live like it will. It never dawns on you that it couldn't happen because you believe that it's going to happen. Okay, let's give a good example here. Okay, The woman with the issue of blood believed that Jesus could heal her, believed that Jesus didn't have to talk to her in order to heal her, believed that she didn't even have to have a moment of his attention if she could just touch the hem of his garment. She said, I don't even want to inconvenience him. Okay, and the Bible says as soon as she did, that later on it goes to tell us how it happened, but that she was made whole. She's healed. Okay, Jesus says that he perceived that virtue had gone out of him, right? Or holy righteousness had departed him. Well, he turns around and he starts talking. They figure out what happened. I just believe that if I could just touch him, not even him, just his clothes, that I'd be made whole. What did Jesus tell? Thy faith has made thee whole. But right? what caused the virtue to leave Jesus and enter that woman faith Jesus didn't command it to happen although he was in charge he knew she was there he knew what she was doing and if it was the will of God that she wouldn't be healed it wouldn't happen but knowing all of that right, Jesus could have turned around and said be healed he didn't he waited until after she had made contact with the hem of his garment before he stopped and said, who touched me? There were a lot of people that were bumping into him, very few that touched him. Okay, faith is the substance of things hoped for. Her faith got her through that crowd. The disciples even said, Lord, there's a multitude around us and you're wondering who touched you? They say, no, who really got a hold of God is what he was asking. But her faith removed the obstacles from her to get to Jesus. But once she got there, right, she didn't change her mind. 
her fears, her apprehensions didn't interfere with the fact that she said, I've come all this way, I'm going to touch the hem of his garment. How many times have we seen people that they get so close, but right when it matters most, their faith gives out? But that, that, there was no evidence. They believed to a point, but they didn't believe enough to have it come to fruition. Right? And don't get me wrong, we're not doing prosperity gospel affair. I used to joke with Brother Lawrence all the time. He'd say, Brother, I got a flat tire today. I said, if you'd had enough faith, that tire would have got you. <laughs> right? I used to do that to him all the time because it made him so angry. It was, it was funny to watch him get worked up. All right, his face get purple. It was hilarious. Right, but bad things happen to people that got faith. Good things happen to people that have faith. Right, but this isn't the faith that we're saying, if you believe God's going to give you $10,000, if you believe it hard enough, it's going to happen. Right, God owns cattle on a thousand hills, but maybe God gave you a job so that he can give you $10,000 over a period of time because he knew that you'd waste it if he gave it, to all, gave, it all of, gave all of it to you at once. He knew he could trust you with the job. He knew he couldn't trust you with a lump sum payment. Right, but what did her faith, that woman with the issue of blood, what did her faith evidence? Her faith was not only strong enough to get her there, but her faith was real enough that when she made contact, God rewarded her faith with himself. Go read the accounts. doesn't say that her issues take Jesus said, virtue departed from him to her. Part of God left God and entered that woman to make her whole. You want to know the true evidence of things hoped for? We can't have all of it down here. We can't have streets of gold. We can't have, you know, the manifest vision of God because the Bible says that no man see him and live, right? I can't see him in the flesh. I can see him in the word by faith. But I can't see him in the flesh. I just melt away. Right? I'll remind you, our God is a consuming fire. Anything that isn't holy that gets close to him just disappears. It's not that God says, nope, that's unclean. You just can't get close to God without being holy. Because He is holy. That, that's just how it is. That's why when we approach them things, God's not really going to take all our deeds and weigh them and say, well, this is wood, hay, and stubble, and this is gold, silver, and precious gem. When we approach them, them things that aren't pure are just going to evaporate. And all we're going to be left with is what was real. Right? There are things that we can't have down here. But the evidence of things, I still hope for them things. I hope to see them. I right? hope to bow down and worship at his feet. I hope for the day that we all get to cast our crowns at his feet, saying that he's worthy and that we're not. Right? I'm looking forward to the marriage supper of the Lamb. But see, those are the things that are hoped for. Those are the things that aren't seen. So what's the evidence? Well, the evidence is that my faith is rewarded with just a little bit of them now. What did you get when you got saved? The Holy Ghost. The earnest of your salvation. And let's be honest, that little bit that he done gave us, that's too much for us to understand as is. Too much for us really to comprehend. And then every now and then you'll be listening to a song, or you'll be reading a verse, or you'll be listening to preaching, and that little bit that he did give you gets so excited that it just works its way out. It's too much for you to handle in. Right? Imagine if he'd have given us any more. We'd just explode. Right? Well, what's that evidence? The evidence is that God rewards because of our hope for things not seen. Because of our desire to see God do those things that God wishes to do, every now and then there's just a little bit of evidence. And what's that do? Increase our faith. So that we have a stronger footing to keep our lives oriented towards the things of God. God's not a cruel master. He's not a taskmaster like the Egyptians were to the Israelites. God wishes to do good unto his own children. But see, every now and then, he just gives a little handful on purpose. He gives some pressed down, shaking above it, not because we did anything to deserve it, but just because our faith needs to be increased. 
I'll remind you that half-breed woman that came to Jesus, he called her a dog. He said that it wasn't meat to take the master's, what was meat for the master's children, cast it under the dog. She said, truth, Lord. She said, but the dogs even get some crumbs every now and then. Right? She had great faith. And what was the evidence of it? Jesus said he hadn't found faith like that in all of Israel. Hadn't seen it among God's own children. What did he do? He rewarded her faith. Right? But she said, Lord, help mine unbelief. She said, Lord, I believe. Help the unbelief in me. Your faith's good. If you've got faith, you're, you're fine there. Faith is a... The apostle wrote, building yourselves up on our most holy faith. You know why it's a holy faith? Because it didn't come from us. The Bible says that faith was imparted unto man. God gave unto every, unto every man a measure of faith. Truly, if you use your faith to embrace heavenly things, it's a most holy faith. Because you're using the faith that God gave you to deny self and embrace Christ. That's a most holy faith. How do you improve upon most holy? You can't. Holy's holy. Not holy's not holy. Right? There's no in between. So if we're supposed to build ourselves up on our most holy faith, you can't improve most holy. What can you improve? Unbelief. You put your faith in Christ as your Savior, that's a most holy faith. That's why your, your faith was given to you. So that you could believe upon the Son of God. But what keeps us from having more most holy faith? Most holy, that's, the, that's 24 karat gold. right? I forget the standard that it is for diamonds. But like the the best of the best rating, right? That none of us would ever be able to afford, right? Right? Creme de la creme, most holy. Can't get better than that. Well, then why, if people have a most holy faith in Christ as their believer, or I mean Christ as their redeemer, their believer, can't take that back. God says it's forever settled in heaven. Right? You know why your salvation is unrevocable? Because one, God promised it, and God can't lie. Two, because you didn't do the work, God did the work. And if God does it, it's forever settled. But then furthermore, if God gave you something, instructed you to use it to believe on His Son, but then rewards it, if He were to take it back, it would make God a liar. It's impossible for God to lie. He gave unto you so you could believe. But it's most holy because, really, when you look at all the, all we had to do was allow God to do what God wanted to do in the first place. Was that, Lord, have mercy upon me? He wanted to show us mercy. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. The only thing keeping God from saving anybody is their own will. Is that they won't let God do it. You know what faith really is? It's just saying, Lord, whatever you want, I pray that you do it. That's a most holy faith. Lord, I'm not going to give you any conditions. I'm not going to temper it with what I desire to have out of this or what I want to see done. Lord, I'm on board for whatever you want. That's what a most holy faith is. But how many people have a faith that says, well, God, I want this, but with this condition attached to it. In Congress, they call that earmarking or pork barreling. That's where they take something that's really pop popular. There's no way that somebody's going to vote against this idea because it would kill their political career. And then on the back page, we're just going to start adding stuff that we know it and all that popular, but if we just attach it to this really popular idea, it'll get through and nobody will be the wiser. Now, they've been doing that for years. Well, really, they've been doing it for hundreds of years. But anyway. What's all that designed to do? Smoke and mirrors. Right? Yeah, God, I'm in favor for what you want to do as long as I can still have this. That's not faith. 
According to verse number one, faith is the substance of things hoped for. If you really wanted that, you'd give this up. Because you know that you can't have this and that at the same time, so you're hoping God will write in an exception for you. Well, show me where God ever made an exception for anybody. God's no respecter of persons. God will remove all the barriers that He removed for other people, but God's not going to let you keep something that He told everybody else to let go of. So, all that being said, we know what kills faith. That's doubt. We've heard a whole lot preached on that. Doubt will kill faith. We know that faith's important. Why? Because without faith, it's, it's impossible to please Him. Right? Faith, we know how to grow it. What's that? We just got to keep getting that faith to God. Praying, Lord, increase my faith. Help my unbelief. What are you asking for? You're asking for more evidence or substance of things hoped for and evidence of things not seen so that your faith can continue to grow. Lord, give me a verse here. Give me a song there. Lord, give the preacher a message that will help address this thing that I'm struggling with so that I can give it to you. What are you asking for, really? You're asking for more of God in your life. Because that's the only way it can be a most holy faith. Not me. Lean not on my own understanding. The arm of flesh is going to fail me. But I'm more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. Why? Because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. And you know what that verse really means? Greater is he that's in me than me. Yeah, of course God can conquer everything out there, but i got to let him be able to conquer me, change me into that new creature. Conquer my flesh so that my spirit can reign free. But all that being said, we know what kills faith. But this morning, just want to ask a question, what keeps people from having more faith? We know what will kill the faith you already have, but why don't people have more faith? Now, we know what is faith and what isn't faith, but how come we're satisfied with just this much faith? Why don't people want this much faith or this much faith? At what point do people get to the point where they say, you know what, I think I believe enough. We don't say that outwardly, but the evidence in our life says that we only hope for this much from God and then we're trying to do the rest of our own. That the evidence is we believe God this much and that the rest of the things that we hope for they're not those things in heaven. Why? Because I want this much from God and then I've heaped up all this stuff from the world along with it. Truly faith right, is something that I cannot do. First thing that will keep people from having more faith is because of this thing in between their own two years called a brain. I said, God gave Adam a brain that we can't even comprehend to the point where Adam looked at a giraffe and said giraffe only in whatever language Adam spoke because I don't know. This is before Babel. Right? So it wasn't Hebrew. Right? Maybe it was Hebrew, and then after Babel, I don't know, but a little. Doesn't matter, really. But whatever language that Adam spoke, when he looked at a giraffe, he said giraffe. And when he looked at, you know, a tree, he didn't just say tree. He was like, that's a Douglas fir tree. Right? Or that's a maple tree. Right? How did he have that ability? Because God gave it to him. Right? Adam's brain was not inhibited by sin, which means his eyes could see spiritual things as well as physical things. He was able to see God and live. And yet with all of that, walking with God in the cool of the day, right? he could look up and he could see angels descending and ascending into heaven. He could look into the sky and see past the second heaven, which is space, and he could see into the third heaven, which is the domain of God. And yet, through all of that, his faith, he had a whole lot of faith. In fact, a little bit after this, okay, you're going to find that Abel, who was Adam's son in verse number 4, he had faith. Where did he get that faith from? Well, he believed what his father had taught him. And he believed it so much that he was willing to live by it. 
But even though Adam had seen all of it, he believed he needed Eve more than he needed God. The Bible doesn't say that Eve deceived him. Eve was deceived by the serpent. But Eve didn't deceive Adam. He saw it, he knew what it was, and he ate it. Why? Because his faith only went so far. He loved Eve so much he thought he couldn't live without her. You know what that tells me? Adam didn't believe that he couldn't live without God. What kept him from having more faith? This thing. He started thinking. Now, do you remember what it was like before Eve? God tried to give Adam every. I honestly believe that at one point Adam looked like he was Dr. Doolittle. Walking around. Because the Bible says that God tried everything that was created to give a helpmeet unto Adam. I believe horses were walking next to him saying like, Hey Adam, what are we doing today? Right? Everything that God had made, birds swooping in. Hey Adam, anything we can do today? But nothing filled that void in his heart, and his soul. So God made him and helped me out of man, which is why she was called woman, and her name was Eve. Right? What, what happened after that? Adam had to help. Adam was complete. He was perfect, but he wasn't complete in his soul. Okay, God knew that. That's why God made woman. But at some point, don't know how long it was from the time that they was made until the time that they sinned in the garden. But at some point, Adam stopped believing that he needed God as much as he needed Eve in his life. That's why he took it and he ate it. He was thinking about all that Eve had done for him, but he had forgot about all that God had done for him. Now, he still had faith. He's still walking with God and talking with him in the day. But how many people come into church on Sunday, you know, get in an altar and talk to God? Right? They'll get in on a little bit of worship. They believe that God's big enough to show up here. They just don't think God's big enough to handle all the problems in their life throughout the week. They believe that they need the approval of the boss more than they need the approval of God in their life. They believe that if they don't have enough, you know, on paper, if the math doesn't work out, that after they give their tithe, they're not going to be able to meet all their expenses. Right? They believe that their tithe should be less than what it should be. See, that's the thing about tithe. It means tenth. You can't give a tithe unless it's a tenth. Anything less than a tenth isn't a tithe. And the Bible says that you're robbing from God. The Bible says that God doesn't like those that rob from Him. He'll handle that very swiftly. And He'll handle it in a way that I guarantee you we're not going to get on that. Just give a tenth. And then after that, we'll get on what an offering is. That's above a tenth. Anyway. But there are some people that just believe that, well, God, I, I can take care of everything with 92, so I'll give God a, that you don't believe. you got a faith problem. Because I found out that God can do with 90 a whole lot more than I can do with 100. I've found out that if I give God what's His, then God gives me things that are His. What's that? Blessing. Favor, fellowship, companionship. My, my faith is that I don't need this because this belongs to God. Did not Jesus say, render unto Caesar what's Caesar and render unto what God what's God's? You know what that means? I don't care how much the government takes out of my paycheck because God knew they were going to take it out of my paycheck long before I ever knew I did. I'm supposed to give to them what I owe them and then at the end of the year, every year, they tell me, oh, you gave us too much. I'm like, I know, so why do you keep taking so much out of my paycheck? But anyway, that's called a refund. Point being, I just believe that God knew about all that. God knew how much the tenth was before the taxes were taken out, so that's what I give. But see, I've just got enough faith that if I give that, He's got to not only meet my needs, I've found evidence that I get desires in my heart, that I get the rich choice blessings of God in my life, what's that? Those are things that I don't even comprehend. Psalm said, daily he loads us with benefits. How much do we really comprehend all that God does for us? All the times that God says, 
to that guardian angel, hey, be on the lookout. Something that never enters my life because God had already handled it. I don't understand that. Doesn't even dawn on me that something could have happened, but yet God took care of it. Right? Those things that are too great for us. I mean, some people worry themselves sick about all the things that can happen in a day. Yeah, but if they don't happen, they're not a problem. That why waste all the time planning for A through Z and then going back and starting all over again? Worrying yourself sick about what could happen. All I know is that what's going to happen is what God wants to happen. So I'll just let Him handle it. Those things which I can handle, He's promised to equip me for them. Prepare me for them. And I'd rather be committed to learning the lessons that He wants to teach me so that I pass the test. Right? You've only got so much brain power. You can only think about so many things in a day, Brother Brian. You've only got time enough in a day to spend so much energy thinking about so many things. Eventually you're going to tire out. You're going to have to go to sleep. Eventually you're going to run out of time. But what's that tell me? I should only be concerned with the things that truly matter. Faith says, I've only got so much thought in a day. I've only got so many words in a day. I've only got so many steps and actions in a day. I want to live by faith the way that God wants me to live. Some people don't have enough faith because they don't spend enough time thinking about what God wants. They think that God's big enough to handle this much in their life and they got to figure out the rest. Show me chapter and verse on that. Show me them times when you know, all the apostles or the disciples or the members of the early church, something bad would happen and instead of, you know, throwing their arms up in the air and saying, well, it happened and we didn't see it coming, they win. Oh, when something about blindsided them, how did they address it? Lord, you knew this was going to happen, but Lord, we know you want to do something out of this. We're just praying that what you want to happen does happen and that you get the glory for it. And the next thing you know, they're lowering Peter down over a wall in a basket after angels came to him and let him out of prison. What do you say? They were concerned with what God told them to be concerned with. See, some people don't have more faith because they're trying to figure out how they can handle it. There may be a way you can handle it, but it's going to be better if God handles it. What do you say? God may want you to do the very thing that you're planning. But if God gives you peace on it, then you don't have to worry about all the other ways that you could do it. God's giving you peace on how you should do it. You know what that does? Frees up more time for you to be concerned about how God wants you to live that day. The peace of God that passes all understanding, you know that verse that we love to quote. But once you really have it, you know what that means? It passes all of your understanding. That means that you're just content and saying, all right, God, that's enough. Somebody say, explain it. Uh, it's one of them things, it's a, this is a substance of things, it's the evidence of things I've seen. God said it, and I've just got the belief, the faith, that it's going to happen. I can't explain it, but he just spoke to my soul, gave me peace on it, gave me a verse on it, and I know that's what I need to do, so I'm going to be concerned about the Father's business. If we really understood how much God wants to unburden us of, all that it takes is just a little bit more faith. He said, well, how was the Apostle Paul able to be concerned all the time about all them different churches? Well, I find that there are times that he's out there mending fishing nets, or that he's out there working for a leather maker, or that every now and then God would set him down in a place, give him a bit of mental rest. And he'd just be working with his hands for a little bit. But throughout all of that, you know when he was resting, what he was concerned about? Well, God, what do you want me doing next? Well, next was another church. There's another chance for him to testify in front of some political official. There's another opportunity for him to walk into a town, perhaps, like it was... You know, walked in, they had that big 
pantheon devoted all them false gods and then there was one that said the unknown god he said hey I know who that is and he's more real than any of these other jokers in here but he said he was always free of the burdens of the flesh but he wasn't perfect he'll tell you that chief is the sinners that there were days that he didn't do the things that he would do, and there were days that he, things that he wanted to do, he did the exact opposite. He wrestled with the flesh like us, but he learned that through faith, God could unburden him from a lot of those things in the flesh. Apostle Paul wasn't worried about where his next meal was coming from. He wasn't even worried about where he left his stuff. Read some of the stuff that he wrote to Timothy. He says, hey, by the way, can you bring the parchments? Can you bring that coat that I left? Uh, and... Uh, you know, the, uh, the books that I left with this guy, he says, can you just bring all that with you? The Apostle Paul wasn't worried about where he left his stuff. He knew God knew where it was at. What are you saying? More faith means that I've got to let go. Some people don't have a lot of faith because too busy thinking. Some people don't have enough faith or have more faith. they got some faith, but not more faith. Because it means that they got to let loose. You were okay with letting loose of eternity because you knew that was too big for you. That's why you got saved. You're saying, Lord, I don't understand it all. I know what, you, what, what I need. And you just embraced it. Okay, you let loose. That's what repentance is. Lord, it's too much for me. I'm turning from it. And I'm going to give it to you. But see, how come after we get saved, there are so many things that we want to put our fingers in, get our hands on, when the very first lesson we learned about faith is that if I give it to Him, He can take care of it. Because we don't want to let go of it. You know what that's called? It's called pride. It's mine. I worked for it. I earned it. God gave it to me. But I find that Abraham, even though God had given him Isaac, Abraham was willing to give them to the Lord because he knew God could give them right back. Raise them up from the ashes. What's all that say? If you're holding on too tight, you're never going to let go without more faith. If you're holding on too tight, it's because you think it's yours. But I find it all belongs to Him. Even children, their heritage of the Lord. You know, that means God lets you borrow them to raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. They were entrusted to you so that you'd raise them knowing about Christ. It never says that they're yours. They're lent to you for a while. The Bible says, nothing new under the sun. You know, that means everything that you're trying right now, somebody's tried it before and failed. But that also means that there's somebody in here that God's recorded as an example of when they handled it, but they let God handle it, everything ended up okay. There's no new method that you're going to come up with to figure out how to appease God or please God with you still holding on to everything. Not going to happen. Been a whole lot of people tried that. You know what happened? They all fell flat on their face. If a man think of these things, let him take heed, lest he fall. And when they fall, they fall hard. But I find that those that stand, it's because they're on the solid rock. And instead of building their own house on the shifting sands, they just say, Lord, you gave it to me. But instead of holding on like this, people with faith, they hold on like this. Lord gave it to me. I'm going to be in tr I'm going to be responsible with it. But if God wants it, He can take it back. It's His. It's not mine. Everything I have, He just gave it to me for a little while. In truth, everything that He gave me is going to burn up in a fire one of these days when He destroys the earth. But it's His, and if He wants to give it to me, I'll enjoy it while I have it. But it's always His. Faith holds on with open hands. Like as Lord, if you want to give more, I'll carry it. If it's a burden, if it's a blessing, I'll take it. But if you want to take it, whether it's something I love or it's something I hate, it's yours. The thing that stops more faith, 
not doubt. People tell you they believe it to God. He's the one that saved them. He's the one that keeps them. He's the one that did everything that they needed in order to be saved. But what stops them from having more faith? Because they want to have control. The true desire of their life is not what's in it. They've got a desire for earthly things. Some people are so afraid of losing that God can't give them more because they won't let go of what they have for God to replace it. What causes that unbelief to stay unbelief? Because we just convince ourselves in these magical little brains of ours that God can't, God won't, or God isn't interested. Show me chapter and verse on that. I find he was tempted in all points like we. Yet was he without sin. Why? So that he could overcome it in our life too. Everything you're facing, Christ faced it before you, you know, for you, long before you ever existed, so that when you faced it, he could give you the answer. He's a high priest. What's that mean? He's overcome it. But because he's overcome it, he can show us how to overcome it, how to handle it. But when we hold on too tight, God won't yank it out of our hands. But He'll get us to the point that we're desperate enough that we're willing to let it go. You can increase your faith through losing everything. Surely, those that have faith, they've abandoned everything else except their belief for God. Everybody that ever came to Jesus... They were so desperate that they knew nothing in the world could solve it. So they brought it to Christ. Why? Because they knew He was the only thing that could do anything with it. Those that come to Christ and their faith is rewarded, true faith is when they just say, God, you're my only option. I've let go of everything else to come seek after you. And I'm willing to do whatever it takes, stay however long it takes willing to go wherever it takes, cross whatever obstacle in my way. Why? Because I believe that you're the only one that can do it. Because of their faith. Well, if you're holding on to everything else, you're not going to turn to God until all this is gone. Surely faith is saying, Lord, I have nothing but you. All these things you give me, they're not really mine. The only thing that I really have in this world is a relationship with Christ. Because that's eternal. That means everlasting. Doesn't matter what happened, nothing. I'm in His hand, His hand's in the Father's hand. Nobody can erase that fact. You can take the car that I drive, the place that I live, the Bible that I read out of. You know what you can't take? Him. He's the only thing that I have. What keeps people from having more faith is that they don't realize the only thing they really have is Christ. Because if they truly believed that, all of their faith would be in the only thing that they really have, and that's the one that has them in the palm of his hand. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.